Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Hello, hello, and welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us today on the DJE Podcast. Our guest is George Abreu. They have acquired thousands of units of multifamily. Uh, they own their own construction company. They've done gone from single family to, to a huge multifamily operator in Texas and some other states. So we, we dive into why he got into multifamily, how he built that team, what the team looks like today, what his role is in that organization, you know, the ups and downs or growing a company and being an entrepreneur um, straight from the horse's mouth, the CEO of the company. So I think you're going to learn a lot and enjoy George's story. Before we get into that, a couple notes from our sponsors here. If you are not seeing the DJE deals that we send out and you would like to, you can register at djetexas.com, get access to that deal flow. Secondly, if you're interested in operating apartment communities or forming a partnership to go buy and operate apartment communities as an investment, we created apartmenteducators.com as a complete ecosystem to do that from the coaching, the network, the connections, the team, the whole thing to be able to go out and run and do this business like we do and lots of our uh, students do too. They're out buying, you know, 100, 200, 300 unit deals left and right. So there's a, a content a free course you can get started with at apartmenteducators.com. That's it for that message. I uh, hope you enjoy this conversation with Mr. George Abreu. Here we go. George, welcome. Good to see you again. How are you? I'm doing good, Devin. Nice to see you, man. It's been a, it's been a while. Yeah, that's right. It'd be good to catch up here. You guys have absolutely been blowing and going from what I see online and just kind of following along <clears throat> your acquisitions and, and deal flow. So I, I want to get into all that for sure. But we'll start at uh, kind of the beginning with for our audience here, maybe that hasn't heard of Elevate or hasn't met you at a conference or an event. Um, how did you how'd you get into this space? What was your what was your on ramp into real estate? Yeah, so uh, it started um, back in college. I was starting to be an electrical engineer, and I knew I did not want to be an electrical engineer. Um, I knew I wanted to start something on my own. Wasn't quite sure what, but uh, started reading some books on successful individuals, and and a lot of it went back to real estate. And I kept, you know, seeing that trend. And that's what kind of piqued my interest. And then I started doing some research, uh, eventually ended up hiring a, a coach on, this was single family back then, 15, 15 about 15 years ago. Um, started doing real estate investing on the side while I graduated and then started, I worked at UPS in the engineering department um, until finally I started making enough money with the real estate and quit my W2. Um, and then in the single family space, pretty much did everything from, we did a lot of fix and flips, which led to starting a construction company uh, to scale that part of it. And then wholesaling, we did do uh, some holds, some smaller multifamily, some fourplexes, eightplexes, single family as well. And then finally about, oh man, creeping up on maybe five years ago, uh, I got introduced to multifamily syndications. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that existed before. You know, I would look at these apartments and I knew they were, they were trading, but um, I figured you had to have millions and millions of dollars yourself to buy these. And then when I realized you can bring investors together and take them down um, as a syndication, kind of blew my mind. And yeah. You know, I went the same same path. So I, I went and I found a coach, and and I wanted the the fast track to to figure this out. Um, being an engineer, or at least studying to be an engineer, um, the number part parts came natural to me, and and I enjoyed the underwriting and the fact that you know it was more of buying a business versus buying a single family home. Um, so put all my focus towards that. And, and, you know, four, 
four and a half years, five years later, we've acquired a um, little bit over, I want to say 7,000 units at, at this point and um, got some big goals and just continuing to, to grow that portfolio. I love it. How, um, what market were you guys doing the single family projects in? So single family, I started actually in South Florida. I'm originally from Miami. I got okay. uh, Cuban parents and born in Miami. And uh, after 2008, when the market crashed, you know, the East Coast and West Coast were hit dramatically. Couldn't, sure. couldn't pretty much touch real estate. Um, that's when I decided to move to Dallas, Texas and continue to do the single family and eventually the multifamily. On the multifamily side, we, we are pretty spread out. I mean, uh, we've got a large presence in, in Texas, Dallas, Houston, and some other parts. But we also have properties in Oklahoma, Georgia, Florida, um, all the way up to South Dakota. So, I mean, we're pretty open on location as long as it's a landlord-friendly state and uh, we can see the, the growth and population and jobs and those things. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. On the, it seems like a pretty um, standard tra trajectory, you get into single family. That's what I did. You kind of go through that and you run into some scaling limitations. Was there a point where you just got tired of the single family or was it a matter of kind of just getting your eyes open to the syndication space that made you transition over the larger stuff? No, that's a great question, man. It, it actually, it was perfect timing. I, I was getting, you know, I kept hitting this brick wall um, in scaling the single family and just the, the amount of transactions that we were doing, it, it, it was wearing down on me. Um, yeah. So, you know, that is something else that, that led for me to go all in on, on multi. For sure. Yeah. It's a grind. <laughs> I, yeah, I did, yeah, I did way is. too many. Um, and it's like, I don't want to own, you don't want to own 300 houses. No. Look at the utility bills. You're like, geez. Uh, and, but I talked to a lot of guys that have had success in real estate and maybe they did short-term rentals or single family. And they, there's like this barrier, this mental block going to, let's say a $10 million building. So what it's just two different tracks, right? A lot of similarities, but it's just two different worlds as you well know, what was the catalyst to get you onto that other track, not having done it before? Was it, was it a mentor? Was it, you know, a partner? What, what was that that got you, um, you know, to make that change, which is a, it's a big shift, right? It's a big mental shift. It is. It is. I think it's a lot of mindset, right? Just looking yep. at those bigger numbers and then um, raising equity and, and having, you know, all these investors counting on you, right. To, yeah. to deliver. Yeah. Um, definitely different from what we were doing in the single family space. I think, I think the mentor definitely helped, you know, seeing somebody that had done it and then also being part of that group and seeing others that, that, that had done it and, and nothing special to them. Right. There's no big difference there. Um, I would say probably that, I mean, without seeing that, it might've been really hard to get past that in my mind. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a weird kind of monkey see monkey do deal. And you meet a regular guy or gal that's done it and something just clicks yep. like, Oh, these, these guys did it. Um, what was that first deal that you did that, that, you know, there's this weird thing that happens when you close on a deal, all of a sudden the brokers start calling you and now yeah. you go from somebody, uh, I had a guy explain it to me once. He said, there's a lot of people standing outside the store with their face pressed up against the glass. And, and I just bought like a six unit. He's like, you're in the store now, man. There's not many people in the store. You're, you're actually doing it. And I thought that was an interesting analogy. But, you know, once you do that first deal, things change. What, what was the first one for you? So first one for, for us was a 37 unit. Um, nice. Yeah, it was, you know, a little smaller than, than I would suggest just because sure. we were very hands-on um because of the size and just the fact we couldn't have full-time um staff on site but good experience for sure um and like you said once we got that one closed then it was like oh okay you know we, we from there we went to a 216 unit and then uh, i think like another 200 unit then we jumped up to a 1200 unit portfolio and oh my uh, gosh, I love it. It's been going from there. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, a transaction is a transaction uh, the, other than the amount of uh, zeros and dollars and equity um, might as well go close a 400 unit than, than an 80 unit. Um, yeah. Cause you're still going to, you know, you're going to have all the same challenges. It's just, you're going to have more people get to come along for the ride on the bigger deals. The construction team, was that something that has, that has tra- made that transition with you? Cause Multifamily construction. There's a there's a lot of moving pieces, huge amount of uh, you know materials, and and the you know you might be renovating a hundred units on a property, which is different than the the single family stuff. Did those guys make the transition? You've had the kind of c- construction team the whole time, or how did that work? Yeah, no, it it, it definitely made the transition. Um, it's helped us tremendously. Uh, before I even. S- so we would do we would do the renovations to the single family homes, right, our own, and then we did start taking third party work. And on the third party work, I started making that that transition to multifamily and commercial work even before the investments, just because oh, I saw it was a lot easier to work with that clientele on the third right. party, right. And um, so I already had the crews, I already had everything. Uh, so it was pretty simple to make that transition. And, and it's been, like you said, with the materials and just um, labor, you know, trying to find labor, it's been very helpful to us. Yeah, hundred percent. And the ability to execute. I mean, that sometimes the, the bank draws and the number of units you need to be renovating every month. I mean, that stuff gets pretty intense the first year after takeover on some of these projects. So having it in-house is, uh, you know, a lot of headaches, but also a lot of advantage on your execution, right? For sure. For sure. I mean, uh, you know, I could deal with the headaches as long as we're executing. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. And you're going to have to deal, you're going to have to deal with contractors one way or the other in-house right. or third party. So you might as well control the the whole stack. Well, let's kind of shift and talk about the team. I mean, you guys are doing thousands of units, multiple States, big deals, you know, the equity requirements on these deals is probably in the five and $10 million plus range per project. Um, what's the, what's the elevate team look like today? So today we, we've got a full-time underwriter. We've got, um, asset manager. Um, we've got investor relations myself. We're, you know, I do a little bit of everything, um, and try to, uh, paint that, picture of the vision and, and make sure we stay in line. And then um, got my other partner, Eric, who does more of a COO kind of role, just overlooking the operations in general. Sure. Um, we've got full-time marketing and then uh, probably going to bring on another underwriter and um, move our current to more of an acquisition role. Um, and then on the construction side, I mean, there, there's, we've got about 20 payroll employees on, on that side. Um, cause we do also still do third party work on there as well. Right. Right. Are you keeping those guys, uh, mobile? Are they going to different markets or you guys kind of stay around that North Texas area? How's that work? No, we, we definitely do mobilize in, in other areas. Actually, one of my project managers was at the airport right now going to our project in, in South Carolina. Um, a lot of our crews travel with us. So it helps, especially in, in some of the smaller markets, it's mm-hmm. really hard to, to find um, good contractors. So um, yeah, they're, they're mobile for sure. Yeah. Well, that's, that's awesome to be able to have that. What about the property management component here? Um, you know, you've got your construction in-house, which is, can be really effective. Are you guys using different third-party management companies? Did you, did you build your own company? How did you approach that piece of the puzzle? Yeah, it's like you're reading my mind. Um, <laughs> it's all the same struggles we all face, right? I, yeah. I'm sure I've faced them all. Yeah, we've used, uh, you know, a lot of third-party management companies. We, uh, right now, our portfolio... Uh, we've got one company that that manages a good portion of it, maybe seventy percent of it. Um, and then we've been working on in-house, and I think uh, getting ready to roll it out here pretty soon. Yeah, that's great. That's all. I mean, you guys certainly have the scale for it, right? 
Yeah. You have the skill for it. And it's, uh, you're paying it either way, right? You're paying, you're paying for it. I mean, there's no, <laughs> there's no getting rid of your payroll line items on your multifamily properties or your property management fee line items. It's just whether it's on your balance sheet and P and L or somebody else's. Yeah. And, uh, what I like about having it on our balance sheet P and L is I get the truth, right? People can exactly. tell me the, the bad news. And I've had the third party experiences like we all have had where it's all sunshine all the time. And you're like, these deals, they don't run that smooth. That, that There must be something that I'm not uh, in the loop on, right? It's funny, man. I mean, I think, I honestly think regional managers are there to hide the truth from you almost. And that's with right. every management company we've dealt with. And it's, it really is. It really um, so is. we wanted to get really good at asset management first before sure. we brought the in-house and we feel yep. like we're, we're there and we've done everything we can to push the third party property manager to where we just can't do any more other than bring it in-house. So yep. it's the next step for us. Yeah. Well, look, you got, I mean, the equity piece is covered. The construction piece is covered. You've got the asset base uh, to support that. You know, if you look at your, you know, globally across your company, what you're paying out for third-party management fees, that's probably pretty healthy revenue. You could just turn, turn in house and support some, some corporate staff. So yeah, that's uh that's good. I had a, a regional manager tell me once I, I showed up on site. He's like, man, what are you doing here? You, you ought to be on the drink beach, drinking a pina colada. We got this. And I was like, <laughs> ah, I think that's overselling it a little bit, buddy. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Some of the stuff, uh, you know, even now we, some of the regionals just want to talk to us on, on the calls. We're like, no, sorry. We, we like to speak to the full staff. Like, right. Yeah. So you get the, it straight from the horse's mouth. So yep. it's a hard business. We all know that, but you're paying for it either way. The money's going out. And um, if you can do it, you've got the scale, which you guys certainly do then. Yeah, that's right. Um, bring it in house. Well, that's cool, man. You guys will be, you guys will be a juggernaut at that point then with the construction, you, you know, the private equity component, the property management full stack. And that's, that's powerful. What are you guys looking to do? I mean, right now we're, as we're speaking kind of late 2022 debt markets are a circus. We're all trying to figure out how to get deals to pencil, but um, you know, what, what are you guys going after these days and trying to add to the portfolio? You know, we've had a lot of success with um, a class deals. Yeah. And getting them straight from the developer for the most part. Like during uh, their lease up? During their lease up. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the earlier, the better, honestly. And uh, kind of just taking those rents to, to the next level and uh, adding some other income and, and things that maybe the developer didn't see or just didn't care to implement because they just want to build it you know, get it occupied or, or not <laughs> and sell it. Yeah. If they can sell earlier and hit their numbers, take, yeah. take the exit. Right. Right. And then I just think, you know, your C-class properties have increased so much in price. Right. And that margin between the C-class and the A-class has it's shrunk impressed. so much. It just makes sense, man. So, so we've been targeting a lot of that. Not that we don't do, we'll still go after some, some C-class stuff. If, if uh, we feel like we're getting a really low basis and we can add a good amount of value, but um, yeah, that's kind of the space we've been playing in. Yeah. I mean, look, how, how has the A stuff? Yeah. Do you want to buy the biggest, cleanest thing you can? A lot of times we've, you know, only been able to kind of make it to maybe a B plus asset and still feel like the numbers could pencil. <clears throat> What's experience been like on the management side? You know, once you, once you take over on a class A, um, I got to imagine a lot less r and different tenant base. I mean, all the kind of challenges we have in B and C multifamily got, have to look different, right? Yeah, I'll just, we got a, a weekly report a couple of days ago from one of our A-class properties and the delinquency for last month on there was showing uh, $30. <laughs> and this is a 396 unit apartment. Um, you know, you don't see that stuff in the C-class, right? Uh, right. So that, that's definitely nice. Um, obviously, lower maintenance. Um, the fact that you can implement some of the other income and some of the stuff, you know, we've got the 
we got one that we just closed on about a month ago and we're going to do smart units and we're going to start charging extra for the smart units and um, just things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Um, so the, the company's grown tremendously, right? Thousands of units, millions of dollars, equity, all that good stuff. How do you see, how has your role as CEO evolved and what, you know, what's allowed you to, to scale like that? Cause it's kind of the entrepreneur's dilemma to, you know, think they're the only one that can do X, Y, Z, have a hard time handing it off, but you guys have, have done that. What, how do you see your role and how's that evolved? Yeah, I will go back to the the single family to multifamily. I think that's another kind of mindset or not really mindset, but something that some of the single family investors struggle with because right. a lot of the times in the single family, it's just you and, you know, maybe you have a small team, but in multifamily to scale, at least a size that, you know, I want to get to, you need a team, you need a strong right. team. Um, so that's been something that, for the past year, year and a half, I've put a lot of focus on finding those team members and then um, putting them in the right seats and just me stepping away a little bit more from the day to day and, and really focusing on the team, um, managing them versus you know the day to day stuff. Uh, so that's kind of where my role has changed a little bit more and um, been getting more of the branding and, and just putting my face out there, going to events and, and that kind of stuff, because I have a team behind me that allows me to do that. Right. Do you think that's, uh, do you think that's kind of your specialty? I mean, we all have strengths and weaknesses. And I think the, the people that identify what they're good at and enjoy and double down on those do well, you know, what would you say is your strength or superpower as you know, in this big organization now that you run? I would say my strength is is coming up with the the vision, the goals, the plan, and then you know what we need to get there and kind of putting that team together. I would not I would say that public speaking and networking and that kind of stuff is probably not my specialty, but it's something that that I've just kind of taken head on and um, continue to get better at it, but it, it's not. If you would have asked me a few years ago, um, come speak at this event, I would have probably told you no way. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's incredible, man. I mean, uh, kudos. You're all over the place, right? You're over social media, events, speaking. Um, for someone that is not like naturally pursuing that stuff, that's that's a huge win. And it's uh, it's growing the business, right? I think the proof's in the pudding. The Correct. unit count, the team, and, and and all that stuff. So that's... That's really powerful. Well, I, I want to finish up with a couple of questions. One, I'm sure you have this conversation and now your investor relations team has this conversation around somebody that's looking at a passive investment, but hasn't done it. You know, what do you say to that person? And then somebody that's looking to go get into this business as a syndicator or operator, but hasn't done it. What do you say to each of those, each of those people? Yeah. Somebody that's looking to, to invest passively in multifamily. Um, you know, I would ask them, First, I like to ask them what their goals are, like what, why are you looking to invest these funds and, and are you looking for cash flow? Are you looking to um, grow that money quickly? Uh, what is your end goal? Um, once I have that, then I tell them, well, you know, if we can find you a deal that aligns with those goals, um, why not? You know, we also go touch base on the, the tax benefits part two, part sure. of it as well. And, um, you know, me personally, that's, that's the part that blew my mind is, to, I mean, the returns are great, but when I started benefiting from, from the taxes, I mean, that, that was just a game changer, you know, me, totally. instead of paying the government this money, I'm literally just taking that money and, and investing it somewhere. Yep. Um, so that's what, that's what I would, uh, tell that passive investor. And then as far as I think the second part to that was somebody looking to become an operator. Is that right. correct? Yep. Um, you know, I would say don't quit your day job right off the bat. Sure. <laughs> um, it, it takes a little bit of time to gain that traction and then to also start getting 
a good amount of income coming in. Um, so try doing it on the side first and then, you know, kind of working it slowly and there's, there's different ways to do that. And then it's a lot of work. I know, you know, but, um, it, it's not easy, man. It's not easy. There's, there's a lot to it when you're operating these apartments and, and to do it, to do it right. And right. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, there's a, there's a spot for everybody to participate. You want to go full passive and not worry about it. That's an option. You want to partner and do some of it, but not all of it. That's an option. And then you want to, you want to take it all on. That's an option. Just realize what you're taking on, right? Yep. The buck yep. stops with you. And that's a, uh, you know, your Atlas at that point holding up the world and there's nobody to, there's nobody to look to, to, to help you out. It's on, it's on you and your team. So uh, big responsibility, but hopefully the, the rewards are, are in line with that work workload as well. So that's why we, that's why we do it. Well, this has been a really good look at your business and your trajectory. Um, I've enjoyed watching what you guys have, have done and what you guys will do. If somebody listening wants to connect, what's a good avenue for that? Um, our website has a ton of content and, and free information. If they go to elevatecig.com, um, if they want to shoot me an email as well, which is my first name, George, or spelled Jorge, J-O-R-G-E, at elevatecig.com and tell me that they heard me on this podcast, I can also send them like our arsenal of free content. I love it. Yeah, you guys have a lot of great content. Well, thanks for coming on today. Uh, George, I wish you guys a, a good rest of the year and a success ahead growing out the property management company and look forward to uh, catching up with you soon. But thanks for jumping on. Thank you, Devin. It's always fun, man. All right. Take care. Yep. Thank you for listening to the DJE podcast. For more information, please go to DJETexas.com.